the role of science in the fight against climate change. Climate science has been the diagnostician, told the world which direction things were going in. Where we are now is moving from diagnosis to treatment. What to do when the water runs out? We've had to implement urgent measures to provide water to the cities during the summer. And what exactly is a Pembrokeshire dangler? The phenomenon is most common in autumn and winter, when cold Arctic air meets still relatively warm water. It's Friday the 5th of November and you're listening to Weathersnap from the Met Office. Hello, I'm Claire Nazir and this is Weathersnap, an insider's guide to the week's weather headlines. Well, you can't have missed the fact that COP26 launched this week in Glasgow with some rousing speeches from world leaders, youth activists and Sir David Attenborough, all on the theme of our changing climate. Midweek saw widespread promises to end deforestation, while financing action on climate change has been a key theme. Underpinning this, and previous COP events, is climate science. Accurate data is vital for assessing the levels of greenhouse gases and the impact of human activity. Climate correspondent Graham Madge is at COP26, and earlier this week he spoke to Sir Patrick Vallance, the UK chief scientist, and he explained the importance of climate science in measuring and addressing climate change. Sir Patrick, we've seen that climate science has made a fantastic contribution. Where do you think climate science needs to go now in terms of getting us to net zero? Well, well, you're quite right. Climate science has been the diagnostician. It picked up the signals. It told the world which direction things were going in. It's been remarkably important to reach now a very universal consensus as to where we are and to define the boundaries of that and to make sure that 1.5 is understood to be the limit. And we've got to aim for that. Where we are now is moving from diagnosis to treatment pretty rapidly and climate science will be part of the therapeutic response as well. How do we know we are headed in the right direction? What do we need to measure to be sure that we're on track? In terms of the solutions that are possible with being on a pathway to net zero, Is there a role, do you think, for climate science to advise which of those pathways might be best? Well, I think where where climate science can help is to look at the solutions that are being proposed and advise on where you're likely to get the biggest bang for your buck. But, and I think this is quite an important but, we shouldn't allow that to be a sort of cherry-picking type of approach where people say, well, I'll just do that one, because we know this is a widespread whole society change across a range of areas it would be a big mistake i think to start to say i'm only going to go for area a b or c and ignore d e and f which are very important so yes climate science i think will help i think the measurement the direct measurement of things like emissions is going to be important as we go forward as well so we know what it is we're trying to correct and can tell that we are correcting it and i think governments are going to find this very very important and you know they already know that they've got to listen to the climate scientists They need to know, they really need to listen to them now as we enter this phase of urgent therapy, not just diagnosis. Given your experience of the COVID pandemic, what would you translate from COVID into the new challenge that we face with climate emergency? One of the things about COVID, science has been absolutely central to the response to COVID and it's been global and that international science has been crucial. We know that we're going to need to make changes individually. We also know that data are going to be important. So one of the really crucial things in COVID has been access to data that can allow us to monitor, understand, respond to what's happening. Same is true for climate, data flows, data analysis, data visualisation, being able to help the decision makers to understand which direction things are going in, where uncertainties are, because there are lots of uncertainties, and how to narrow that uncertainty with experimentation, trial, measurement, correction. UK Chief Scientist Sir Patrick Vallance. Here in the UK, there is clear evidence that climate change is making our winters wetter and milder, with an increased risk of flooding. However, a very different set of impacts are faced by other countries, which historically suffer from water shortages. Countries like Chile. 
Chile is already home to one of the driest parts of the world, the Atacama Desert, which receives on average just 15 millimetres of rain per year. Here's Chilean Science Minister Andreas Kuva talking to Graham Madge. Chile is a country that suffers seven of the nine vulnerability criteria that has been established internationally. Uh, one of them, very clear, that has been affecting the country recently is drought. Uh, Chile has the Andes Mountains, accumulation of snow, ice and the glaciers, significant, significant amounts of, um, of, uh, of water in the mountains. And we've been uh, having a very dry season that has extended for 10 and 12, or 12 years. So it's been a very long period of time. And that is already affecting the human population, is affecting agriculture. And we've had to implement uh, urgent measures to provide water to the cities during the summer. So it's a very clear manif manifestation of climate change. Similar to what happens maybe in the Pacific Islands where the sea level rise has affected communities. In our country, the lack of water is severely affecting also some communities. Together with that, uh, we have some issues in biodiversity. Uh, we have uh, the desert, which is advancing to the south. And of course, it's a country that has a very long coastline. And along the coastline, uh, many uh, cities, uh, villages, and also uh, fishing uh, towns are suffering from uh, severe uh, climate events, uh, the rise of sea levels. So uh, in general, I would say that uh, Chile is a country which is suffering directly the effects of climate change in a very significant matter. And it also uh, means that we have to act urgently. And this is what we've been doing from the Ministry of Science and articulating the scientific community to have the scientific advice, recommendations, and know how to act to fight climate change. If there was one single action coming from COP26, what would you hope that would be? I would say the agreement to limit the emission of greenhouse gases, but also focusing uh, with an equivalent uh, emphasis on adaptation, which is local, and as I said before, the local adaptation that we have to commit to uh, with uh, drought and with other um, of these uh, issues of climate change is, is quite um, important in Chile. And at the end of the day, it's also about funding. Uh, and we need to, of course, get the funds, raise the funds, work with the public sector, the private sector and academia. So I would say uh, ambition, uh, finance and adaptation and mitigation commitments. Well, let's talk about weather right here in the UK, and specifically of runner showers that have affected West Wales this week. The showers are due to a recurring phenomena known as a Pembrokeshire dangler. Here to explain, Helen Roberts. A Pembrokeshire dangler is the result of something called a convergence line. A convergence line is a band of cloud that remains fairly stationary and can produce large amounts of precipitation across a relatively small area. Showers generally develop in a fairly random way and can pop up as a result of very small differences in localised heating, for example. But sometimes showers form less randomly in lines or bands when winds blow from different directions and collide. This forces the air upwards and if there is enough moisture, clouds form and give rain. Pembrokeshire dangler is a phrase that's been in use for around 10 years and is attributed to meteorologist John O'Rourke. The term refers to a narrow band of showers that form between Ireland and Wales and dangle down from the county of Pembrokeshire. The phenomenon is most common in autumn and winter, when cold Arctic air blowing through the Irish Sea meets still relatively warm water. Pembrokeshire danglers can last anything from just a few hours to several days. And despite the name, showers aren't confined to Wales. They can extend as far as Cornwall. Danglers may also generate hail and snow and can be responsible for widespread snowfall across parts of southwest England, as was the case in 2005, when 20 centimetres of snow fell across parts of Bodmin Moor.
Helen Roberts. So what can we expect weather-wise for the next few days? Here with the details, Aidan McGiven. It's been a bright but fairly chilly first week at COP in Glasgow so far, which has also been the case across much of the UK. However, a change in the wind direction this weekend and a strengthening of the wind will bring milder conditions to the UK, but also more changeable conditions with more cloud and some rain at times. Having said that, actually, before the really unsettled weather arrives on Saturday morning, Friday evening looks reasonable for bonfire night. A lot more cloud in the sky compared to recent evenings, but most places dry, just some outbreaks of mainly light rain towards northwestern hills and coasts. And it's in the northwest where the weather turns unsettled Saturday morning. Heavy rain across Scotland and Northern Ireland, along with strong winds. That wet and windy weather sinks south into Northern England and Wales by lunchtime, with the risk of coastal gales in places. But for the south and southeast, it stays largely dry, albeit fairly cloudy and windy throughout much of the day. To the north, again, for Scotland and Northern Ireland, the rain clears by lunchtime. And here we replace the wind and rain with blustery showers. It's a mild wind direction, though, so temperatures a few degrees higher than they've been throughout the last few days, with highs of 13 to 14 Celsius. But the wind strengthens further across Scotland and Northern Ireland in particular on Saturday night. Northern Scotland at risk of seeing gales or severe gales around coasts. Wind gusts in excess of 70 miles an hour in some of the more exposed locations. And that strong wind coinciding with spring tides, so the risk of coastal impacts, big waves and uh, disruption from those winds. By Sunday, the wind is still strong across much of the country, so it's a blustery day for many, particularly around some of the hills of northern England and Scotland. But it's a drying up process through the day with most of the rain confined to the north and northeast of Scotland, and even here it will be fairly showery. Towards the southwest, it turns brighter with some sunny spells, but it stays windy throughout much of the day, and it's a little bit cooler compared to Saturday. Into the start of next week, the weather stays changeable, a frosty start for many on Monday before the next area of low pressure moves in to bring further bouts of wind and rain, particularly in the north. Thanks, Aidan. Now here's Martin Bowles with last week's highs and lows. Here are the UK weather extremes observed between Monday the 25th of October and Sunday the 31st of October. The highest recorded temperature of the week was 18.4 degrees Celsius at Chillingham Barnes in Northumberland on Tuesday. The lowest recorded temperature was minus 1.0 Celsius at Kinbrace in Sutherland early on Sunday. In a spell of widespread wet weather, the highest daily recorded value was 84.8 mm at Eskdale Muir Dumfrieshire on Thursday. The largest sunshine hour total of 8.4 hours was recorded at RAF Watersham near Ipswich in Suffolk on Thursday. Thanks Martin. That's it for Weathersnap. I'm Claire Nazir. Editor is Adrian Holloway. Weathersnap is a podcast by the UK Met Office.